May 12th of 2020 marked the release of the Tom Hardy vehicle Capone, the comeback and rebound movie of the notorious Fant Forstick director Josh Trank. In promoting Capone, Trank is back in the limelight, and now, four years later, he has, for the first time, told his side of the events behind the infamous collapse of Fant Forstick, and subsequently, his career. His version of events is something I am very interested in, as our extensive coverage of what we, at the time, dubbed the Trank Gate Saga, was Midnight's Edge's first claim to fame. In this Trank Gate retrospective, if you will, I will go through Trank's own description of his meteoric rise, including his brief stints on Star Wars and more, and his fall from grace over Fant Forstick. I'll cross-reference this with Midnight's Edge's own Trankgate coverage, and finally, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, give my take on it all and how a disaster like Fant Forstick could ever happen. If you haven't seen our earlier Trankgate coverage, you can find it by heading over to the playlist header, where you'll find it under the Trankgate playlist. That's incidentally also where you'll find all live shows, the Toxic Femininity podcast, and anything else that otherwise might be tricky to find. Trank's story was chronicled by Polygon. However, it should be noted that he is still bound by NDAs, so this is no tell-all. Furthermore, many of the antics Trank himself was rumored to have personally engaged in at the time are very conveniently not addressed either. Even so, he does confirm much of what we previously could only speculate, and therefore adds new information that complements what we already knew of how a disaster like Fant Forstick ever could happen. And for those who react to that, Fant Forstick was indeed the marketing title of the movie not the Fantastic Four. So Fant Forstick it is. With that out of the way, let the saga of Josh Trank begin. Trank's story begins with his childhood, which we learned even at the time wasn't the happiest one. Kid Trank had issues with self-esteem and self-image. However, he had parents with ties to showbiz, and following the breakup of his parents, his father remarried a woman with even closer ties to showbiz. Young Trank relocated to Hollywood, where he was always the poorest kid in class, which didn't help his self-esteem issues, on the contrary, it gave him a giant chip on his shoulder on top of them. While he didn't tell this to Polygon, he has said before that during this time, he was also teased for being fat and for having man boobs. But on the plus side, his upbringing gave him connections, both directly and indirectly, that any other aspiring filmmaker would have done anything for. Good thing too, because Trank wanted to be the next Spielberg. That was an express goal of his. His own work and tenacity, coupled with the aforementioned connections, greatly contributed to giving him his start in the industry, first doing editing, uncredited web shorts, and eventually setting the stage for Chronicle, his directorial debut. Trank was an unknown commodity at the time, so Tom Rothman of Fox fame wisely demanded to see a filmed proof of concept before giving it the green light. He had to make sure this young aspiring director actually could deliver what he said he would. The resulting proof of concept showed that Trank could deliver something like Chronicle, so the green light was given. Chronicle was such a low-budget feature that Fox looked the other way. Rothman had, after all, more pricey projects that demanded his attention and micromanagement. And in the case of Deadpool, blocking. In the end, though, Chronicle was a huge hit for all involved. And although screenwriter Max Landis would later claim the success happened in spite of Trank more so than because of him, Trank quickly became the IT director of the day. He was on a roll. He had meetings across town, projects were offered him left and right, and he even met a woman who was attracted to the formerly fat kid, now hottest filmmaker in town, and six months later they were married. But was Trank really the next Spielberg, or was it just hype that everyone bought into? Oh. 
Chronicle was a huge success for Trank. If anything, he was actually more successful than Steven Spielberg had been at the same point in his career. But rather than basking in the glory, or taking delight in actually being on the trajectory he set out for himself, Trank felt no happiness. Instead, Trank told Polygon he felt anger. Anger at the kids back in school, which to me indicates some pretty deeply rooted issues. This got so bad that he once punched a wall and broke his hand, which to be fair is a frequent outcome of hand versus wall encounters, which is why you generally shouldn't engage in them. But Trank did, and in the aftermath of that, he reached out to filmmaker Robert Rodriguez, whom he apparently barely knew, for some Yoda-like spiritual guidance. Rodriguez responded by sending him some self-help books. Told you they barely knew each other. It seems to me, at least, that this is where Josh Trank should have sought out professional help, because from Polygon's write-up alone, it seems clear that Trank's issues were adversely affecting every aspect of his life. At this time, he had every opportunity handed to him. The world was his for the taking, and it was all his to lose. That's not the time to be buckling under personal issues. Trank became attached to some very high-profile projects during this time, but when he speaks about them now, we see that very little development was actually done on any of them. He was attached to Shadow of the Colossus, but all he recalls from that today is that he had a writer develop one of the squirmiest pitches he had ever seen, without going into any further details. He told ComicBookMovie.com that in the meeting with then Sony Pictures chairman Amy Pascal, she randomly and out of the blue decided he should do Venom, and that's how he became attached to that. Trank claimed to be a fan of both Todd McFarlane and the character, but his take was something entirely different. He told Comic Book Movie, I immediately thought about The Mask. This could be like a really cool synthesis of everything about The Mask that I loved, but infused into the lore of this iconic Marvel character. I thought this was an opportunity to make something really charactery, uncomfortable, and break ground in terms of having this super nuanced, uncomfortable character story with the branding of a massive Four Quadrant superhero film. We turned in the treatment, and they didn't like it. Take note of that. Making uncomfortable things is something of a priority for him, and that will be important later on. Trank told Polygon that more specifically, it was producer Matt Tolmach that didn't like his take on Venom, which was also going for a hard R rating. About this, Trank said, I didn't like how Matt Tolmach was coming at me in that situation, because it felt very kind of authoritative. Well, if you don't like what I'm doing, and you're telling me that I have to do something along the lines of what you want, and you're going to tell it to me in this way, sorry, but I have other things I can be doing. In Tolmach's defense, Venom was always his movie, and however much in name only, Avi Arad's movie. And my reading of the situation is that Tolmach never asked for either Trank or his take. Both were forced on him by Amy Pascal, against that backdrop. Everyone involved probably dodged a bullet by that not happening. Also not happening was Chronicle 2, which Trank did everything in his power to block, probably much to Max Landis' chagrin. In the end though, despite all the buzz and hype surrounding Trank, Despite all the meeting activity, only one project came out of it. He ended up doing another movie for Fox, but an even bigger one than before. They offered him something original of his choosing, but there was also casual talk about Fantastic Four. That was the project that Josh Trank wanted. Not because he was a fan of the comics or anything, but because, according to Trank himself, it was the most rebellious thing he could do. The Polygon article reads, Carrying the mental baggage of Chronicle and the promise of creative control from Fox, Trank entered the development stage of Fantastic Four on the defensive. His first move was to hire Jeremy Slater as his writer. Slater knew comic books, he knew story, and he knew how the director's brain worked. The two would work together in a vacuum, 
There wasn't really any sort of traditional pitching process, Slater said of his first days on the film. Josh just said, Jeremy's writing it for me, and Fox nervously said, uh, sure. They began work in the spring of 2012. This is not in the Polygon article, but it is a crucial part in understanding why things could spiral out of control the way they did. From Fox's point of view, there was never any actual desire to make another Fantastic Four movie. To them, it was a pure rights retainer, a movie they had to release within a hard date, because if they didn't, the rights would revert to Marvel, who would then be free to reboot it themselves, probably making it a hit and making Fox look like fools in the process. Case in point, they first announced the movie back in 2009, the day after Disney acquired Marvel, which was Fox's way of sending the message, you ain't getting this back. So they were making the movie. But since it was but a rights retainer, there never went much care or thought into what kind of Fantastic Four movie it would be. As long as it was a Fantastic Four movie, put out on time and for as little money as possible beyond the contractually stated minimum. If they could have gotten away with a direct-to-video Hellraiser Revelation-style retainer, they would have done that. But they couldn't, so they kicked the problem ahead of them for as long as they could until they had no other choice but to begin. And that was when Trank felt rebellious. So, you have a studio that don't care for the property in question, an IT director with deeply rooted personal issues who wants to be rebellious and use the project as a means of making a statement, and who initially was given full creative freedom to make the movie he wanted. Trank came to Slater with a skeleton idea. His Fantastic Four would be the opposite of every other franchise kickoff. The end of the Fantastic Four was going to very organically set up the adventure and the weirdness and the fun. That should be the wish fulfillment of the sequel. Because obviously, the sequel would be, okay, now we are super powered forever and it's weird and funny and there's adventure lurking around every corner. But according to Trank, the first movie was going to basically be the filmic version of how he saw himself all the time. The metaphor of these characters crawling out of hell. Slater was a badge-carrying nerd, ready to convert comic book lore into bombastic CG-ready set pieces. Trank, however, was the opposite. Having seen a few episodes of the Fantastic Four cartoon from the mid-90s, and having a general distaste for comic book movies. The first Avengers movie had recently come out, and Slater kept saying, that should be our template, that's what the audience wants to see. But Trank hated every second of it. In an effort to creatively engage his director by any means necessary, Slater even loaded Trank up with comics from his personal collection. The greatest Doctor Doom stories, his favorite Ben Grimm moments, but nothing sparked. Trank was more interested in the early moments, digging into Reed Richards' character development and traumatic arc. The two would try to find common ground, watching movies for inspiration. What was the Inception version of the Fantastic Four? The Saving Private Ryan version? The Cronenberg Body Horror version? But the problem remained. Once the team got its powers, that's where it started losing Trank. Galactus, Annihilus, Herbie the Robot, Time Travel, Multiple Dimensions, all teams fighting young teams, everything was on the table, and any sequence or character could get tossed out at a moment's notice. According to Slater, it didn't matter if they were fighting robots in Latveria, or aliens in the Negative Zone, or mole monsters in downtown Manhattan. Trank did not care for it. In his own defense, Trank told Polygon, I felt like I get Mole Man. He's angry and undermined by the system. Things clearly weren't working out between Trank and Slater, who Trank kept out of the communication process with Fox. Slater departed Fantastic Four after six months, without there being a script anyone was happy with. That's when a handful of Fox-approved screenwriters came aboard to knock the script into shootable shape, and Simon Kinberg started overseeing for real. According to Polygon, him and Trank worked well enough together, but as the beginning of production crept closer and closer, and a hard release date hovered over the entire operation, the project moved forward in a less than desirable fashion. 
The script didn't have a third act, and Trank lost more and more control and influence to the many more experienced hands working on assembling the production, many of whom disagreed with what Trank wanted. In pre-production, Trank clashed with his team of previous artists over the flavor of the movie's action scenes, but unlike him, they were all trained in the art of alien invasion choreography. Likewise, on set, not everyone had the time or interest in hearing from the guy who made one pretty good movie. Trank told Polygon, In a studio scenario, you're basically being surrounded by veterans who are going to do a hell of a job doing exactly what it is they do. Because it's not your movie. You didn't come up with it. You didn't create these characters. You didn't create this property. This guy was nominated for Oscars. This guy has made 20 movies with Robert Zemeckis. It's a science fiction adventure movie. What do you need to tell them other than the direction of the agreement between you and the studio? All Zemeckis production designer needs to know is whether this is the take, yes or no. Of course, that type of yes or no still needed producer and studio approval. Fantastic Four was filmed over the summer of 2014. Frank did not recall receiving a complaint from the studio during the 72-day shoot, but just from reading the article, it is clear that the studio were very concerned with how things were progressing. Trank likened his eventual on-set correspondence with then-Fox president Emma Watts to reports out of the demilitarized zone in the Korean Peninsula. There was never bad news per se, but the general feeling was that war could erupt at any moment. The intensity existed, Trank said, and life had a way of exacerbating the situation. Early in production, Trank learned from the set that one of his dogs was at the vet after chewing up some vitamins. By the next morning, the dog had died, and Trank had what was described as the most emotionally aggressive cry I ever had in my life. Oh, I think he had more than just a cry. There were reports that more than $100,000 worth of damage had been done to Trank's rented accommodation, and at the time, this was blamed on his dogs. Yeah, no one believed that. There were also persistent rumors that he was frequently drunk, high, and not always present on set when he was expected to be, something which was hotly discussed online. Trank was clearly overwhelmed by the Fantastic Four production, and not in the right headspace to take on such a responsibility. Even so, he took on another in the shape of Star Wars. Simon Kinberg headed Fox's Marvel division, and he was consulting for Lucasfilm. Before production begun on Fant Forstick, when Trank was still the IT director everyone wanted a piece of, Kinberg recommended him to Kathleen Kennedy. A year later, while Fant Forstick was filming, he was announced as part of the Star Wars family. At the time, Kennedy said, He is such an incredible talent and has a great imagination and sense of innovation. That makes him perfectly suited to Star Wars. But as this was announced, everything was falling apart for Trank, because Fox had seen his first cut of Fantforstic. Trank had pitched Fox a dark and morose body horror take on the Fantastic Four that would make people uncomfortable. Fox had greenlit that dark and morose body horror take on the Fantastic Four that would make people uncomfortable, and the professional punditry were still praising this dark and morose body horror take on the Fantastic Four that would make people uncomfortable. Despite his personal issues and onset antics, Trank had actually made a dark and morose body horror take on the Fantastic Four that would make people uncomfortable. Upon reviewing it, however, Fox came to the shocking conclusion that a dark and morose body horror take on the Fantastic Four that would make people uncomfortable wasn't a fun-filled adventure-styled romp that could be marketed to the mass audience. On the contrary, they now saw what fans had been shouting from the rooftops since the moment Trank's take was announced. This wasn't for the fans. It wasn't really for anyone. And on top of that, it didn't even have an ending. Trank claimed to Polygon that before production took place, 
Fox slashed the budget by nearly 30 million and cut the majority of the spectacle-filled finale with the idea that one could be filmed in the second round of shooting. I'm inclined to believe that. But why? Why would Fox initiate principal photography without an ending even being written? This isn't in the Polygon article. But remember, the whole project was a rights retainer, and they didn't move on it until the very last moment. They had some very strict deadlines to uphold. Production had to begin by a set date, or the rights would be forfeit. It didn't matter how much they had prepped. It didn't matter how much cost Fox had incurred. If the movie wasn't in front of cameras filming by a certain date, the rights would instantly revert to Marvel. As such, they had to begin production, even without a third act being written and approved. Therefore, the emerging plan became to add the movie's ending in pickups. But after seeing it, Fox realized more extensive reshoots would be required to salvage the movie. Assembling the in-demand cast for what was suddenly poised to be much more extensive additional footage than originally planned was a challenge, made much greater by Kate Mara having cut her hair for another role, which meant that she had to be fitted with an extremely noticeable wig. According to Polygon, much of the scramble to save Fantforstic remains shrouded by NDAs and Trank's own lack of participation. At the time, however, we reported on rumors suggesting that Trank hadn't been invited back for the reshoots, which instead were overseen by Simon Kinberg personally. Fox hired other writers to generate script pages to be shot during reshoots, though Trank never met them. He wrote pages himself in the hopes of putting his voice back in the film, but the pages were dutifully ignored. The studio hired editor Stephen Rivkin, whose credited work includes Avatar and the first three Pirates of the Caribbean movies, to re-edit Trank's initial cut of Fantforstic. Rivkin ultimately chose different takes for every single scene in the movie, and became, in Trank's words, the de facto director. But in Trank's mind, Rivkin chose the bad takes, takes where the actors moved faster, but where the performances weren't as engaging. By January of 2015, the studio had already spent three months plus millions of dollars for planned rewrites and reshoots that would fit Rivkin's cut. A teaser trailer that month supposedly inspired new directions for the film, which by then was out of Trank's hands. This was when whispers of the turmoil reached Disney and Kathleen Kennedy at Lucasfilm. Polygon doesn't go into any more detail about who did that whispering to Kathleen Kennedy, but according to the rumors we heard, it was Simon Kinberg. He had recommended Trank to Kennedy in the first place, but that was back when Trank was the most hype director in the business. According to the rumor, he could no longer stand by that recommendation after witnessing Trank's job performance on Fantforstic. Either way, Trank would be the first in a long line of directors Kathleen Kennedy hired to do a Star Wars movie that in the end did not do a Star Wars movie. Trank said he and Kennedy agreed that the director should sit out his scheduled appearance at the 2015 Star Wars celebration in April, which he blamed on a bad case of the flu at the time. According to Trank, he dropped out of Boba Fett voluntarily because he knew he'd be fired if he didn't. Days later, the trades nonetheless reported that the director was fired of his Star Wars movie. When that happened, Midnight's Edge had only existed for a couple of weeks, and Trank's firing became the subject of the very first Midnight's Edge mini-documentary, however crude it was. Since then, we would document all the shenanigans transpiring behind the scenes of that production. For Trank, of course, the whole ordeal was a personal tragedy. He had some lapses in judgment here and there, but overall tried playing the PR game as best as he could. But it all came to a crashing halt on the eve of the movie's premiere. Fox had tried hiding the movie for as long as they could, but on the eve of the movie's premiere, the reviews dropped, and they weren't pretty. In an ill-advised attempt at salvaging some face, Frank tweeted, 
A year ago, I had a fantastic version of this, and it would have received great reviews. You'll probably never see it. That's reality, though. Except it wasn't. It was a bold-faced lie. Unlike with Justice League, where there really is a locked Snyder Cut, however compromised and with however incomplete the effects work, there never was a locked Trank Cut of Fantforstic. His initial cut from the year before didn't even have an ending, so it was never more than a work in progress, and it was never fantastic. The tweet, as he sized up in retrospect, was spitting in the face of every person who attempted to make his version of the Fantastic Four work. It offended his collaborators and silenced the friends he had in the industry. And on top of that, it was estimated to have shaved 10 million from the movie's box office. The hype was over. Josh Trank disappeared from the limelight. The offers obviously stopped coming, and he spiraled into a depression. His marriage fell apart and ended in divorce. But many had sympathy with him, and he was able to get one project off the ground, namely Capone, starring Tom Hardy. And to be clear, it was Tom Hardy's participation, not Josh Trank, that was the key to get that movie funded and made. If Tom Hardy at any point had dropped out, there would have been no comeback for Josh Trank. With Capone, however, he has a second chance, and there have been no reports of any onset antics like there were before. Time will tell what he will make of that comeback. I wish Trank the best, and hope he has found a way to deal with the personal issues that were tormenting him, and obviously extremely detrimental to both his personal life and professional career. If he hasn't done so already, I hope he will seek out professional help and therapy, because the self-help books that Rodriguez gave him obviously weren't enough. But what of Fantforstic? Having a go at it quickly became the cool thing to do. Even the cast threw shade at it. Listen, you didn't see it. Didn't see it. Neither did the rest huh? of the world. You didn't see uh, it? Anyway. But how does it mesh it up now, four years later? Was it really that bad? Yeah, it really was that bad, and it still is. The movie is a visually ugly Frankensteinian abomination of shifting and even competing creative visions. Tonal inconsistencies, terrible writing, and terrible acting by talented actors who were all miscast, every last one of them. The movie was made for the wrong reasons by a studio that didn't care about the property. This is what enabled the pairing of a filmmaker like Josh Trank with a property like the Fantastic Four, which was a match made in hell. Trank didn't want to make a Fantastic Four movie. He wanted to be rebellious and subvert it. And on top of that, he buckled under the pressure of making a big studio movie and had too many personal demons to act like a professional. In my opinion, the movie's one and only redeeming feature is that it is a great case study in just how bad things can turn out when everything goes wrong. They might have set out to make a Fantastic Four movie, but due to the circumstances under which it was made, they ended up filming a visual representation of Murphy's Law. Let me know your thoughts on Fantforstic and on Josh Trank now that you have heard his story in the comments.